So welcome back to the Aerospace Executive Podcast. I am, I'm, I'm really happy to have an old friend with me, uh, Bob LaBelle. Bob is a former Navy officer, Naval, uh, Naval Flight Officer. He, uh, he was the, one of the key developers down at Leonardo Bell and uh, working with the, uh, the AW609 program. And he's now the CEO of XTI Aircraft, which uh, I think is uh, one of the more exciting startup companies in aviation right now. XTI uh, Aircraft is, a, uh, is developing a uh, hybrid electric vertical takeoff landing aircraft capable of uh, 300, or 300 nautical mile, I'm sorry, 600 nautical miles at 300 mm -hmm. knots with four passengers, Bob, five passengers and a pilot? Four, four plus pilot, or five plus pilot, yes. So I think it's something that can, you know, watching Bob and XTI grow over the years, I think it's a product that's gonna revolutionize the light jet segment of business aviation and beyond. And hey, I'm gonna shut up, Bob, and take it from there. How are you? Good, good, thanks, Greg. Good good to see you and, and hear from you. And uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk to your audience. So, so yeah, you're talking about XCI. Uh, XCI Aircraft is uh, in Denver, Colorado. We're, uh, we're, we're formed to uh, develop the TriFan 600, which is an airplane that has three fans uh, for lift. It has uh, two in the wing and then one in the rear fuselage. So the three fans provide the lift to take the airplane off vertically and land vertically. And then uh, the wing fans tilt forward and the airplane transitions to fly like a regular airplane. And of course, much more efficient when you're going forward using the wings than trying to beat the air and go, go vertical. Uh, the rear fan then turns off and is covered over. Uh, the, the airplane was designed to, to address what is 70% of business aircraft trips, which are typically 500 nautical miles and three or four passengers. So with that in mind, you know, we sized the airplane to carry uh, four passengers in the back. One passenger can sit in the front. It'll be single pilot IFR certified. It can fly at uh, 29,000 feet and 300 knots, as you mentioned, Craig. And um, so it, it easily services that 500 nautical mile business trip by having an, a, a range with reserves of 650 nautical miles. Um, and the airplane can also take off and land like a regular airplane. So with a conventional takeoff, the rear fan is not activated and you just take off like an airplane. In that case, you can add a thousand pounds of payload to the, to the airplane. You can put more people in it or you could add more fuel. And if you add more fuel, you can get out to um, 1200 nautical miles. So you can really cover some, some reasonable distances. Um, you can also pack more people in it and do a vertical takeoff and landing and, and shorter, even shorter range like New York to Washington or something and carry as many as eight passengers. So it's got a lot of flexibility. It's a huge cabin. We're also addressing emergency medical services market. It can easily accommodate a, you know, a litter. That's what it's like a stretcher and a couple of uh, uh, attendants. So all of that combined uh, gives us a huge market out there. And we've already accumulated 203 reservations for the aircraft, which represents- What's, what's, your, market, what's, your, what's your market research telling you the most popular trip is gonna be? Is it gonna go from the New York heliport down to Washington, yeah. DC? Um, maybe over, sure. over Chicago? Yeah, there isn't yeah, there, there is one specific one, but those are those are typical of of what the market research tells us is is where the uptake is going to be. So even though we originally uh, sort of aimed toward a, a business aircraft application or a personal aircraft, you know, lots of people have airplanes of this size and price in their personal flight departments or their company's flight departments. What we're seeing is most of the uptake is from people who provide a service or want to provide a service point to point. And this airplane becomes the tool by which they can do that. So one of our, for example, one of our, uh, our more prominent orders is from a major US private aircraft operator. And they're planning to set up a service between you know, various points. And you, as you say, DC to, to New York or, or even DC, uh, New York to Chicago are a couple of those, but you could go all the way around the world and combine a number of city pairs and, and you'll see that that's where most of the, the intended usage is. Well, so it turns out, 
Yeah, sorry. That flexibility. I mean, New York, you know, heck, New York to the Hamptons is a huge, you know, is a huge market for sure. helicopter operators or New York up to, you know, up to Kennebuckport. Right. Maine, or you, you look at, you know, the, the, the Beltway in D.C. and the, you know, the desire for the bankers mm -hmm. in New York to get down to uh, to the D.C., yeah. you know, to the, the Pentagon or, you know, all the, the government agencies, et cetera. I mean, I was, you know, when I was at Gulfstream, I was shocked to hear that the vast majority of Gulfstream flights are nothing more than uh, Teterboro to, to, to Washington National or, or Dallas. Yeah, or exactly. Like, wow, right. Yeah, like, that's that was yeah, that was what you know, what our research showed us that all these flights are like 500 miles. So yeah, like, if you're in the city, New York, and you need and you want to go to Martha the Vineyard for the weekend, for example, which is you know, quite a few people believe it or not do that. You got to drive or get driven to Teterboro or, you know, Westchester. And then they'll fly a large airplane, you know, way overkill, that relatively short distance of a few hundred miles. Whereas with our airplane, first of all, you don't have to get in the car. You can just go to 34th Street heliport, mm -hmm. take off, and then get to Martha's Vineyard, carrying the same number of people that you're probably carrying in the G650. Well, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. That, I know a guy flies a, a Falcon 2000. He flies it from once again <laughs> Teterboro, Teterboro to Martha's Vineyard. Half the time he's right, VFR. Right. Half the time he's VFR. It's a He's VFR up the coast. It's a, it's a, right. it's, it's a whole lot of airplane. It, it's, it's, it's way too much airplane for the mission. And uh, so, you know, the, just a couple of other key items for, for us as XTI are that, first of all, we've attracted a very strong management team. We have the former president of Cessna on as our COO. We have a really strong CFO who's got great experience in, in, in capital market, capital raising. And then uh, we just recently hired as a senior vice president for basically engineering everything related to the development of the aircraft um, from, from Arion, which of course recently went out of business, is Mike Hinderberger, very strong player in the industry, was a chief engineer for several other aircraft and, and VP of engineering for a couple of other aerospace companies. So, uh, and then on down through the ranks, we have extremely strong folks that we're attracting. And the main reason I think is because if you're in aviation, you know, understand um, you know, what's going on with some of these startups, um, you, you know that a short, uh, you know, a 30 mile or 50 mile range uh, for an aircraft that's flying on batteries, you know, just doesn't really light your fire, you know, <laughs> and, and it's, it's a market that has yet to be developed. So, I mean, I'm not saying there's not a use case there, there could be, hopefully there will be, mm -hmm. and then hopefully they're all successful. But we know from our from more, our knowledge of the market and our experience that the longer range um, application is just something that's been waiting the market's been waiting for. We don't have to create new infrastructure. We don't really need to create new re certification regulations. We're working with the FAA on on establishing the, the certification basis using existing uh, rules. And so, you know, the the people that know, I would just put it that way, tend to come toward us in terms of the interest in either working with us or you know, in a lot of our investor conversations, if people know something about aerospace, they immediately get it. That, yeah. And furthermore, like in the, uh, the Uber Elevate paper from late 2016, right up front, four different times, they mentioned that the, the longer range market for VTOLs is the one that's already there and is the one that's likely to be, um, say, satisfied first. We'll and think we about it. I mean, yeah, I mean, think about it. Yeah, like, well, already, you know, in the, and we'll talk about XTI because in just a second, but the, the helicopter market, you think about offshore helicopters right now are huge. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, look, I, I, you know, you're flying over the North Sea in an S92. Um, it's still a helicopter. I've been in a lot of helicopters and, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's an interesting, you know, it's, they're, they're safe, yeah. they're good, but they're, it's, it's a helicopter. It's right. a it's a new market to get there more you know more weight quickly, to a platform that needs it, but you're going a little bit more of a you know yeah you know, we've got the everybody heard has has heard of the EV tall stuff the the guys right. you know battery operated I won't meant you know mention you're going a different direction you're going hybrid with a, the GE Catalyst engine, mm -hmm. turbine engine yeah. powering electric generator. motors which are a generator which is turning your fans you know that that right. technology is already proven in a couple of different industries how'd you guys get to how'd you get to that 
Well, we got to it because when I first joined, we had actually the, the configuration uh, was uh, was all mechanical, you know, typical helicopter type of layout with big turbo shaft engines driving a lot of machinery. Um, it's a really expensive to uh, develop that because everything has to be tested and certified. And then it's also expensive, not only just to develop, but to, to manufacture. So the price of the airplane was looking like, you know, 12, $13 million. And so we decided as a team, let's go look at some alternatives that could broaden our market. Because at that price point, and even though it would still be cool and, and you know, people may want it, it wasn't a huge market. I mean, we had a good business case, but it wasn't like a killer. So we did this, we, we researched and brought in people who knew a lot more about this than we did and came up with a, a variety of, of uh, options and decided on this particular hybrid electric configuration. As you say, it's got a, the core of it is an engine, it powers a generator and generator provides electricity to the electric motors, which are turning the propellers or fans as, as we call them. And then in the takeoff mode, it's supplemented by a battery pack of an additional 250 kilowatts. And that gives you the lift you need to get the airplane up and away. And then once you're on wing flying, the batteries are turned off. So now you can fly on a more efficient, smaller engine than you would otherwise need if you were trying to do it all just with engine and generator power and still get, you know, still get the performance we like. So all of that combined um, creates, uh, created a, an aircraft for us that we think we can sell for six and a half million. So almost half the original price. And that's hugely broad in the market. And then furthermore, we've cut the operating costs down. So predicted operating costs for a mechanical system like that would have been say $1,500 per hour, mm -hmm. maybe a little less depending on, um, you know, some technologies, but ours is now under a little under five, 500 per hour. Wow. So direct operating costs is substantially lower. And then and, what, once again, your maintenance costs now too. I mean, you think about the trans, you know, mm -hmm. electric, you know, generator turning yeah. electric motors. Now I don't need transmissions, uh, huge, exactly. you, know, you know, you don't, you're, you're not worried about gears. You're not worried about complex right. transmissions, all your maintenance, a lot of your maintenance. Yes, goes away. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that's part of the direct operating costs under under five hundred. Is that uh, those maintenance actions are fewer, and when they are, when it does require uh, you know removal and replacement based on a time, the components themselves, like the motors, are not as expensive. So all that wrapped together gives us a really competitive um, you know offering to the market. And so yeah, we we think that. And, and you know you have you have a couple of different power sources there now too. You have the batteries and you have the engine and generator. So you know you've got some backup if you're cruising and you lose the engine, which is highly unlikely. Today's engines are so reliable. Right. You still have you know some time to fly on on the battery uh, as a backup. Interesting. So safety flight. So. I mm -hmm. gotta think now. We're looking at let's. See, you, you're competing directly into in. And I was just reading something the other day about the light jet market. You know, the, you know, yeah, the you're, 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 you've got Charlie Johnson there from Cessna. Obviously, he knows mm -hmm. the light jet market sure really does. well. Mike came over. Mike Hinderberger was you know long-term Gulfstream. Right. Um, I think was he a pipe? Was he a piper too for a while? And he uh, was. Yeah. So they understand that that market. So you're competing now against Honda Jets and Cessnas True. and the Embraer, you know, Phenom, mm -hmm. at least the one, excuse me, at least the 100, probably the 300. And it's a pretty yeah. good, it's a pretty good value proposition at six and a half million bucks. Yeah. And then the hourly operating costs, you're right. The hourly operating cost is really the killer. I mean, if you flew a thousand hours a year, some operators do, uh, and you flew one of those versus ours, you're gonna save a million dollars a year flying our aircraft versus the others. Wow. What's the, uh, <laughs> what's, what's, what's the comp, what's, so what's the, so it, it sounds great. I mean, I mean look, it's, it, and I've been following you for a long time and I love the technology and I love everything you're doing. What's the, what's the risk in the whole, you know, where, where are you seeing the, you know, obviously the benefit is the light jet market has needed some revolutionary technology for a while, or it's, it's been evolutionary for a long time. It's, it, this is revolutionary. What's the challenge? You know, what do you, you know, what's, you know, what, what's the challenges you're facing getting the airplane built, certified? It's well, a, there, there are always, there are always unknowns that are out there you may or may not encounter. So that would be, you know, 
something I couldn't necessarily address. But uh, in terms of execution risk, we feel like we've got it pretty much nailed down. And that mainly goes to the team that we've recruited with the experience. I mean, all combined, I mean, we've got people who together have certified more than 30 different types of aircraft through through the FAA or the military. So um, execution risk is, is fairly low. Technical risk is manageable. There's always issues there. Um, typical aircraft development problems and issues are like managing the weight of the aircraft. We're, we're you know, we have a process for doing that. And so, you know, there's not, we don't think there's a necess necessarily enormous technical risk. We shouldn't encounter too much in terms of just being able to get the job done since we've done it so many times. It comes down to, do we have the funding to do it? That's, that's where, uh, you know, th there's potential risk. Uh, we feel like at, at each iterative step that we make, and demonstrate success, which we have done, um, that risk comes down because now people are more comfortable investing. Oh, yeah. And there's also a lot of precedent in the market right now because some of the EV tolls have been very successful in raising capital. And you know we have clear distinction between ourselves and them in terms of um, the stuff that I already talked about. And so we're pretty confident that we can retire that risk here within the next, say, six months. Right now, we're well-funded. We're good to go for quite some time. Um, I want to get to the point where the whole business plan is fully funded. So you you as an exec, so I've known you a long time. You came out of the Navy. You ran the E2D pro, you, E2D program, the E2D Hawkeye program in the Navy. It was pretty mm -hmm. complex. Then you were at Leonardo Bell for a long time, and you ran a, another airplane, which... How, yeah. quite, quite frankly, hey, look, it, you know, I know you left the company, you know, uh, sort of midstream on that thing, but um, you've seen a lot of, you've sort of seen a lot of startup and development and things like that. Do you think that experience is helping you right now, sort of anticipate some of the some of the hurdles that you yeah you for sure into in the, in the it, it is for sure. I mean, there were pretty some fairly easy to manage hurdles that came up along the way. Any of those experiences. So I, yeah, just to go through that again, I, yeah, I managed large programs in the Navy, you know, multi-billion dollar development efforts. And I went to what was called Augusta Westland, now it's called Leonardo, and was on the presidential helicopter program as the, the lead of that in the U.S. And, you know, as you know, it was canceled for a lot of the different reasons. None, none were on our side. We delivered every airplane on time under budget. No yeah. kidding. Um, then uh, our Italian CEO and decided to uh, acquire the, the, the what was then called the uh, BA-609, Bell Augusta 609 tilt rotor airplane. It had been under development for a long time, but really kind of was just uh, inching along with a limited amount of funding. And so our plan was to buy the whole thing, get it running, and inject sufficient funds in there to get it certified. And we did that at the outset. Um, once again, it was a startup almost. They had contractors and recruiter, recruited a lot of people, got the thing flying, got engaged with FAA. And uh, shortly thereafter, and I don't, I, I don't really, can't really go into the details of why, I just uh, decided it was probably time to move along. And the company then made me CEO of uh, Augusta West in North America. I had a lot of focus on um, getting new business. And, and we did. We've you know, we have the Air Force contract for 100 plus uh, 139s. We have the Navy contract. Every pilot that comes through helicopter training for the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard will fly an Augusta Westland helicopter. So that was great. Yeah. Um, there wasn't much more to do after that. So I decided I would take on a new challenge. And, and this was a real applicable one because of the fact that it's a VTOL. I had worked at the FAA on, you know, establishing certification basis for a VTOL airplane. And so... It brings you a lot of credibility. I mean, it's a lot of credibility with the FAA. It's like, hey, here's a guy who's done it before, um, et cetera. But, you know, so you got a lot of competition, though, in the tech space. I mean, obviously, you know, the, Boy, the new, v, new sure. VP of engineering, how are you finding, you know, it's, uh, you know, uh, engineering talent's got to be hard to find right now. It, it is. I mean, and, and we're really lucky that, that we've been as successful as we have been and probably, which is not as successful as I would like to be in terms of bringing people on board. But, because as you say, there's a, there isn't necessarily a dearth of talent, I hate to say, because 
there's just so many other other companies recruiting and you know offering crazy stuff to uh, potential employees. Um, they're not all. Gonna, reason I say there's not a dearth is because they're not all going to be around, you know, forever. Right. And at a certain point in time, you know, people are going to be looking for jobs. But but we have had some challenge um, finding engineers in particular, um, flight control experts, um, dyna- you know, rotor dynamicists. Those types of folks are are challenging to find. And um, yeah, it's a what are you telling them to convince them? You know, coming to a startup is awesome. Is, is sometimes yeah. it's scary for a lot of people to think about a startup versus an established company. What do you What are you telling them? Yeah, you know, it's uh, what are you telling them? Hey, the yeah, the water's warm here. We're, we're you know, it's, <laughs> you know, or or do you just say, hey, look, we're a startup. You know, if you want the if you want the if if you want the 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 sort of safety of a big company, this isn't the place. But we're doing great things. What's what's the message you take to your to your employees? Yeah, you know, you know what's funny about that, Craig, is that that rarely comes up. It's not really a question of uh, us XTI versus you know an established OEM. Lots of people that working are working in established OEMs want to leave there because you know they don't have the auto- a level of autonomy that we can offer in terms of and uh, the position. So it's a it there's a lot of positives, for, especially for some younger people who, you know, are kind of stuck in some level at a, at a, at a larger company. Um, it, the real challenge is coming from other startups who are offering crazy, as, as I said, crazy money to some people for, you know, for for jobs, but they feel like they have to because of their location or whatever. Our, our big pitch is that, and people get it. I mean, if they know aviation. They look at XTI and the TriFan 600, and they go, "This is an opportunity for me to really make uh, an imprint, mm-hmm. you know, an impact on on the, my chosen profession by helping to deliver this really cool airplane with tremendous capability to the market." That's really what attracts people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, it's it's kind of like I I get have a talk with a lot of people, and they say, "Well, what if the company gets sold?" And I go, "Well, every company's for sale. I mean, literally, every company's for sale. You never know." Yeah. You know. Hey, Raytheon just got bought. L, yeah, L three L three Harris were two yeah. you know, eighteen months ago were two separate companies. You got every company's for yeah. sale. There's yeah, there's no yeah, there's nothing risk free in life. And uh, no, yeah, so, and, and you know you can you can cushion that with some employees by having you know a, a stock an incentive stock option plan. So mm-hmm. you know if the company's sold and they, they they're going to benefit from it. You know and if they end up out on the street or something, they they've got a lot of uh, professional you yeah, know, it's, credibility it's, it's about building your own, it's about building confidence in your team you go, hey look we're, we're doing True. something great here let's give it a let's let's yeah. roll the dice let's let's build something great if it doesn't work out yeah. i mean uh, I, I think True. about the area guys i know you picked up a couple of them mm-hmm. um you know uh, i placed a couple of them uh, yeah yeah within, yeah within two weeks after the company was gone it's like hey look yeah they, they built a great team it's a good opportunity to build yeah when you're doing something really neat yeah, different. Right. It's a good time to build a good. It's a good time yeah. to build a great team. It you know, just doing a startup like this is a slog, though. I mean, it really is. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of days where you go, oh my god, what have I gotten myself into? And the challenge for the leader of that organization is to is to really remain so positive in all situations and have the perseverance needed to um, to boost the team up, to keep everybody motivated. You know, even when you're having doubts yourself, um, so that's a really great, you know, challenge and uh, mental exercise that those of us who are in these positions, I'm sure I'm not the only one, have to go through now and then. You know, but for me personally, uh, I, it's been kind of easy to do that because I, I I totally believe in in what we're doing and I'm confident we're going to be successful. Yeah, I always consider entrepreneurship. It's like being dropped in the middle of the no. It's like being dropped in the middle of the ocean at night, and, and you got to swim to <laughs> land. You're like, all right, yeah. Which way do I go? Which, which yeah, which, yeah. How do I know I'm I'm heading to land and not further out to sea? Right. And right, uh, exactly. You know, it's yeah. it's uh, there's that feeling of panic in there sometimes, but then you know you start to slug. Yeah, you start. To, you know, you see it along. So, yeah. Um, yeah. The GE Catalyst engine. So yeah. you're gonna are you gonna be the well obviously Cessna is gonna be the launch customer for that. Um, how are you feeling about that thing coming along and in, in this development? Yeah, you know, versus it's, it's really I'm I'm feeling great about it. I mean uh, the the 
they're going through the certification process. I don't think they're going to see any real issues. So it's only a matter of time. And they're ahead of us on schedule. So that's all good. They've also made some really uh, impressive gains with respect to the integration of the, gen the one megawatt generator and the, and the um, catalyst engine. I can't say more about it than that, but it's hugely beneficial for us, both in terms of uh, cost, cost of the units together, and the technical simplicity, cost to the customer, really, really fantastic um, advances there from, from GE already. You know, and we're really just getting started with them. And, and this is out of GE Aviation in Cincinnati. Uh, well, obviously the Catalyst engine, but then you're talking about the generator too. They, is it is it yeah. an, is it an IPT that you're working with inside GE? To, yeah, to there is. The they, they have a they actually have a thing called the Epicenter in Dayton, Ohio. So it's Electric Power Innovation Center, and um, it's a huge. It's a, a really impressive facility. In, in Dayton and they've got all kinds of labs and tools and jigs and everything running there you know, doing multiple projects it seems like um, so they've got the talent they've got the facility and and that's who we're mainly working with is a group there but yeah the you know a couple of the folks are out of uh, the headquarters there in Cincinnati too Can and then the, as you mentioned the, the engine is actually uh, you know it was uh, a product that was in development slightly anyway uh, in the company they purchased in Czechoslovakia or mm -hmm. Czech Republic now. I don't know, I don't remember the name of it, but it has a, the, there was an Italian team that was focused on the design. And then I think the Czech team mainly did um, the development and the build and the testing. And so that's kind of the, all those folks that we'll be working with, but the product will be manufactured in Czech Republic. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Um, yeah, as far as I know. Yeah. And, and basically derated, I mean, you, you know, it's turbine engine. So is it, is it derated a little bit to? Not really. It's, it's going to run at a, a constant RPM, like uh, okay. those turboprops tend to do. And, um, you know, they've been able to um, align that with the RPM needed to get the power we need out of the generator. What about avionics? Can you who can you say who you partnered with on the avionics suite? We haven't we haven't formalized anything yet, but we are we are pretty much leaning toward the Garmin three thousand system. You know, we've had informal discussions with them, and those are those are good. I mean, it's it's a great system. You know, it has the we, we want to incorporate their new Autoland system that they have in the uh, they've got it certified on the Cirrus Vision Jet. So if, you know, if anything happens to the pilot. A passenger can just push a button in the back and the plane flies itself all the way, puts the flaps down, puts the gear down, does a beautiful landing, probably better than any pilot can do. So we, we were talking about, I was talking to somebody about enhanced vision, you know, synthetic vision, enhanced vision. Uh, and I'm almost to the point now where for a light aircraft, you know, uh, auto land may just take over the, the, yeah, the auto auto land may just take over for the need for an enhanced vision system at some point. True. Um, yeah. Depending on what the FAA, obviously the FAA may have something to different to different to say about that, but the technology is amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's your competition saying to you? I mean, they're out there. Yeah, you know, some of these light jet manufacturers got to be looking at this, going, you know, whoa, what are they? Yeah, you know, yeah, what do they got? Yeah, you know, how far ahead of us are they? And uh, do you feel like you got a pretty good head start? Um, to compete with some of these guys? We're, we're, yeah, I mean, anybody that wanted to start now is going to be years behind us. And then if you fold into that, uh, if, if it were any of these larger companies, they're just going to take longer to do it just because of the way they're structured and it's going to cost them more. So, yeah, we're not too concerned, not concerned at all about so, so building an aircraft is just one, building an aircraft, you know, designing an aircraft is, is one part of it. Where are you going to manufacture it? In interior configurations? Are you going to bring in a partner and all that? How is it? Have you have you have you gotten that far down the road yet? We, we we're obviously looking at where we're going to manufacture it or assemble it, um, but we haven't decided. I mean, there's a number of good good options. You, you know, we couldn't do it in the Denver area. Um, that's a possibility. Um, there are other areas that are probably a little more attractive for one reason or another. But you know, then you're talking about displacing part of the team and all that. So it's to be determined. There has to be a, 
a compelling reason really to do it somewhere else. And, um, and, and there could well be. What about the, like the interior side of the house? I always thought interior completions was probably one of the most difficult yeah. things on things on, especially on a business jet. Um, sure. you're going to try and keep that in house, outsource it. We're going to keep, we're going to keep it in house for the most part. There's going to be, we're going to have partners that, you know, we've, we've talked to a few that can do say certain customized, cer certain custom jobs that obviously people in, buy these types of airplanes may want. And we'll have specific offerings that um, we're actually setting up some uh, deals with brands, you know, like luxury brands that have a themed interior that reflects that brand mm -hmm. and uh, that sort of thing. So those that type of work, we would definitely have to outsource. And the supply chain, yeah, yeah that's a big, yeah, like, yeah, I started thinking about developing an airplane and it's, where are we going to make it? How are we going to build the hangars? Where do we get the people? The right. supply chain, you know, the supply chain, there's a whole lot. I mean, it's, it's, it, everybody you know, in the world thinks it's so easy just to go out and develop and start to build this thing. But, you know, there's a gajillion moving parts in there. How do you, yeah, how do you start to bring it all together? I mean, uh, right. Well, it's one step long. at a time. I mean, really, you just got to take one step at a time. And yes, supply chain management is, is a, a feature that, that needs to be further developed in the company. And there's a lot more to it than you would find, say, if you're just trying to buy some you know, build some consumer good and you, that may have a lot of suppliers. It's, in our case, you know, they have to be, they have to be certified. Um, there, we have to have a quality system in place that, that, you know, they can subscribe to and, you know, we can check on whether or not they're meeting it. All, all those things. You're right. It's extremely complicated, but it, we just take one step at a time. We do advanced planning way out. Uh, and then, you know, when it comes time to implement one or more of those plans, we just, you know, we set up the resources and, and just kind of make it happen. Just kind of when you, and when are you thinking, you know, your you know prototype stage now? When are you thinking first, first flight type of deal? First flight uh, two years from now. Okay. Yeah, and then certification a year and a half later. So we're looking now into early 2025, first quarter, 2025 for the first deliveries, type certification and first deliveries. Yeah. Four years. So uh, that's, that's pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. Four and a half. Whatever. No, you're right. Four. <laughs> so, so is it scalable? I mean, you're talking about kind of a, you know, 600 mile airplane now, 300 knots, 600 miles. Can yeah. you scale it? Can you scale it to, uh, obviously technology is a little bit scalable. Is it, how hard is it, it to, is. Uh, to build it, a big, it, it bigger is. We've, we've taken a pretty good look at that and, you know, it, it could be scaled way up. We think that the most practical, uh, next larger size would be an aircraft that could carry 12 to 15 passengers. And there's another huge use case available there in thin haul regional transport, mm -hmm. you know, especially in areas where their infrastructure isn't, they don't have 5,000 airports like the United States. So if you go to Africa, for example, you know, just trying to travel a hundred miles can take you all day. The roads are so bad and, mm -hmm. and there aren't that many airports. So if you just had a space that could land a somewhat you know, a larger version of what we have, or even, of course, our current version, um, you can take off vertically, land vertically, fly long distance, you can carry 12 to 15 people. You could, there's just an enormous number of uh, places where that could, is, is needed now. Yeah. So, no. Yeah, it can be scaled up. And I think, I think the optimum upsize is a 12 to 15 passenger mm -hmm. version. No, I, like I said, I love the space. I love the technology. Um, I've been watching the airplane. Well, I've known you for a long time. I've been watching the airplane mm -hmm. a long time. So yeah. it's exciting to see it come together. How do uh, how do people find XTI aircraft? Well, uh, of course, we have a good online presence on Twitter and Facebook, but our website is uh, www.xtiaircraft.com. Lots of good information in there. We put out updates on what's happening with us and uh, all of our press releases are in there. You guys up at Oshkosh now? You have, are, are you no, up? no. It's a, <laughs> I went there. Yeah, I don't want to call it. No, we're not. I just had to throw that one out there. Yeah, with the rest of the world. It's all it is good. Great to see, it's great to see uh, venues opening up again. We will be at NBAA in October, October 12th to the 16th. Um, we've been invited by NBAA to exhibit at the Innovation Zone and there. And there's several other companies like, you know, in the space that will be there. And, it's always a lot of fun for us. We get a huge amount of uh, 
attention because you know it's something considerably different. Look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, thanks, Craig. You too. Thanks for thanks for coming on. Thank you, Craig. Great to see you. Thanks for your time. Appreciate you coming. Uh, www.xtiaircraft.com. Bob LaBelle is the CEO. I hope you enjoyed the latest edition of the Aerospace Executive Podcast. You can reach out to me directly, Craig at NorthStarESG.com, or check us out at www.NorthStarESG.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, or on YouTube. Just do a search for Aerospace Executive Podcast. Thanks again. I'm Craig Pippen.